Welcome everyone to Symposium 15. This is an information session for late stage task groups, submissions of standard editions. So that's kind of a complicated uh, thing. So I'm going to start by talking about what, what exactly does this mean. So for those of you that are not familiar with the TADWIG standards process, there are basically two different ways that people can make changes to our standards. The um, process that's shown on the bottom here is the process by which new standards come into existence. In both cases, there's usually a task group that does the work of building the standards or building the addition or whatever it is that's, that's going to be changed. And because in the case of a new standard, there isn't any, uh, any pre-existing uh, organization. So once the task group thinks that they are ready for that their standard is ready, there is a review manager who is appointed who manages the rest of the process. Um, in the case of an addition to an existing vocabulary, again, we usually have a task group if it's a complicated addition. And in this case, though, there is a maintenance group that is responsible for uh, taking care of the existing vocabulary. So in that case, when the group that's working on the change thinks they're ready, it's the maintenance group that's in charge of the process. But one of the key features in both of these uh, tracks is the public comment period. So once either the review manager or the maintenance group feels that the proposal is mature, they will, um, they will have a 30-day minimum public comment, uh, public review period. And that's where you all come in. So um, all of the presenters in today's session are representing groups that are getting near to the public comment stage. Some of them, um, at least one of the groups already has a review manager, another one already has a proposal into the maintenance group. So within the next few months, you should hear about that there is going to be a public review. So one of the reasons for having this session today is so that you can be aware of what is coming up, what is happening in terms of changes so that you can be an active participant in the process. Once the 30-day public comment period is over, then the review manager or the maintenance group will make any uh, work with the task group to make any final changes. And the last step is to go to the executive committee. If everything is gone smoothly, they will approve it. And then either the change will be made to the existing standard or the new standard will come into existence. So this is the process. The other thing that I want to mention is it is a community-driven process. I think TADWIG is a fairly unusual standards organization because it is uh, run by the community. And so if you want to participate in this process, anyone can organize a task group. So if there's a standard that's missing or some part of the standard that you would like to see added, you can find some other people to form a core group you create a charter, and then you, once your charter is approved, then you do the work. So if anyone is, uh, is interested in how the process works or how you form a task group or whatever, I would be happy to uh, talk to you about this sometime later in the conference. Okay, so that's just a bit of an introduction. Oh, I forgot to say about the organization. So the talks are organized uh, in sort of different categories. The first talks are new standards that are going to be uh, go handled by a review manager. Uh, the second group is kind of an unusual case. This is actually an older standard that is in the process of becoming a modern TADWIG standard. Uh, we'll talk about that later. And then we have two, uh, I guess you could call them extensions, where there's like a kind of an entire vocabulary or vocabularies that are being added. And then the last case is a, is a kind of some complicated changes to existing terms in the standard. So that's kind of the organization of the session. So um, I think you've all heard the uh, spiel about the, um, the sessions. So speakers, 
please speak slowly and clearly. And uh, if you want to ask a question, please come to the front and use the microphone so that the remote participants can hear you. If you are a remote participant, you can put your, uh, your comments in the chat or you can put them in Slack, which is maybe even better because then there'll be a record of that. Uh, okay, so I think that's it for the introduction. And the first, um, let's see, Matt, you're up first, I think, to talk about Latimer Core. Hey, fantastic. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so yes, I'm going to get the ball rolling this morning by talking a bit about Latimer Core, which is a uh, new draft Tadwig standard for collection descriptions. Um, so before um, I get into this, obviously 10 minutes is only really enough time to scratch the surface of this, um, but there is a lot more information that you can go to. I just want to point you at the link at the bottom of the uh, page here that goes through to our GitHub wiki, and um, that's a great starting point for getting into some more information. So if you want to whack that into your browsers and start having a look, then please feel free. Um, but on with the presentation. So what is um, what is Latimer Core? So we all know a lot about Darwin Core and about um, things like ABCD, which are very good at describing things around specimens and objects at an individual level. But Latimer Core is about describing collection objects, um, not individually, but as groups. One of the main reasons for that is that um, specimen level digitization, basically it takes time and it takes resources. And we don't always have individual records for all of the objects within our collection. So in the meantime, we need some way of providing structured descriptions, discoverability to our collections at a higher level. That higher level could be um, as granular as just the objects within a single drawer. It could be as broad as all of the collections holdings of an institution. Um, so what Latimer Core is intending to do is to cover that and a number of other use cases. For example, um, we might want to create thematic collections. We might want to add richer um, kind of textual narratives to some of our more historic and notable collections. And Latimer Core wants to basically provide um, support for those different angles on our collections and providing representation and discoverability, but also to provide some support for modeling the some sometimes um, complex relationships between those collections. Um, and before I go any further, there's probably a few of you are wondering why Latimer Core. So I should explain that we've named this standard after Marjorie Courtney Latimer, who was a uh, curator at the East London Museum in South Africa. Um, and she's also the person that brought the uh, the coelacanth um, to the, the attention of the world back in 1938. So now you know that. Very quick overview of uh, where Latimer Core came from and where we are at the moment. So the precursor, precursor to Latimer Core was the Natural Collection Description Standard, uh, which is a draft standard submitted to Tab Tadwig back in 2008. For one reason or another, um, it didn't end up getting ratified. There wasn't very wide adoption. So there was a bit of a hiatus, but then around 2016, um, there was discussions around the Tadwig conference and um, it basically raised the fact that there was still a need for something in this space. So roll on a couple of years to 2018, task group was formed within the interest group with the mandate of creating a collection descriptions data standard based on the earlier work. That followed, uh, well, then followed four years of quite frantic activity um, of trying to construct this data standard, looking at use cases, writing definitions, trying out different data modeling approaches. And then finally, a couple of months ago, we got to the point where we were ready to submit a draft standard for the expert review. So that's where we are at the moment. Looking forward a bit, um, hopefully if we come out of the internal review relatively intact, we might be starting to get into a position for the public review, the community section, hopefully um, relatively early next year. And that's when you start to get get to start flinging things at us as well. And then looking forward, hopefully we get to ratification in the not too distant future. So a very quick overview of the content of the standard. We've defined 23 classes and 224 properties. Many of these have been borrowed from existing standards, particularly Darwin Core, as I'll get onto um, shortly. But the, um, the core concept of Latimer Core is the object group class. And as the name of this class already suggests, um, this is meant to represent a group of objects that we want to describe. Um, it's got a number of simple properties on it. These could be loosely divided into properties that describe the group as a whole, um, such as the name of the collection or the description or the conditions of access to it, um, and properties which describe the objects within the group, like the object types or the preservation methods. And moving on to, to the wider standard, we have a set of classes, which are basically more complex information um, about the, again, the objects within the group, familiar concepts to you like taxon, geographic origin, stratigraphy. 
There's a set of classes which are more about the custodianship and the management of the collection, and that includes the organizational unit class, which could be used to represent institutions and or subunits of institutions. Um, there's a set of uh, what we consider to be more generic reusable classes, so common concepts like people, identifiers, references, and events. We've pinched the measurement or fact class, which is already in Darwin Core and ABCD, um, to allow users of the standard to define and use more flexible dynamic metrics and narratives and attach those to their groups of objects. And then finally, there's a group of classes that's more about structuring um, and describing the data of a Latimer Core record itself. So that was a very quick run through the content. Um, it's also worth highlighting um, that although Latimer Core is a very long way from being a full-blown ontology, there is some structure to this standard as well. Um, we do consider the classes to be fairly formal in that uh, properties exist within the context of their parent class and can't just be moved in between them. Um, we've also applied some constraints to the what valid relationships can be uh, created between classes um, within the standard um, using kind of link properties on each of these. <clears throat> But the nature of collections modeling um, and um, uh, also the, the breadth of the use cases for collection descriptions means that we need to be quite flexible in this standard. So for one thing, the often very heterogeneous nature of the objects within a collection means that many of the relationships um, within the standard need to be many to many, and we have to permit that. Um, we've also included a resource relationship class to allow people to build more semantic relationships between object groups, whether that be hierarchical or more graph-like. Um, we've tried to take an approach where controlled vocabularies are more recommended than mandated, and that's largely because the scope of Latimer Core crosses multiple domains. Um, and then finally, we've made quite extensive use of generic and reusable classes, and I'll just delve into that last one a little bit more. You can see here um, in the table behind my head um, a list of the classes within the standard that um, we consider to be kind of broadly generic, and that's basically common concepts that could be applied to multiple other classes in the standard and often in multiple contexts. So if I take identifiers, for example, we know there can be multiple identifier schemes that could be attached to people, could be attached to taxa, could be attached to organizational units and other elements. So as standard developers, what we don't want to have to do is try and figure out what all the current and you know, future um, uses of identifiers need to be within this and then generate dozens of very similar um, identifier related properties to hard code into each of these classes. Similarly, we think that users of the standard aren't really going to want to have to propose new terms and then potentially wait months for them to be reviewed and formally ratified before they can include a new identifier type that we just didn't think of when we were developing Latin Core in the first place. So this is largely to um, try to a reduce the standard maintenance workload, but also to allow users of the standard to work in a much more flexible and agile way. So I've mentioned a few other standards like ABCD and Latimer Core. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's worth highlighting that like most data standards, Latimer Core does not exist in the vacuum. It's got conceptual um, overlaps and alignments with quite a number of other standards. Um, that includes Dublin Core for some of the um, more kind of fundamental data concepts. It includes um, around specimen information, Darwin Core and its extensions. It includes ABCD and the extension for geosciences, also the SIDOC conceptual reference model. There's some intersection with the prov provenance ontology, particularly around things like people and activities and attribution. Um, there's some very obvious overlaps with the W3C org ontology around organizations and organizational units. And finally, we've also pinched some terms from um, schema.org around some quite uh, generic concepts like um, contact details and addresses. And there's probably plenty that we haven't identified here as well. So what this kind of alignment means, it does open up potential to be able to, for particular use cases or implementations, substitute parts of Latimer Core for um, more comprehensive standards. For example, you could conceivably say for my use case, I'd like to swap out the relatively simplistic representation of organizational units in Latimer Core and instead hook into the much more comprehensive um, org organizational ontology. Um, some of the approaches that we've taken to alignment for Latimer Core, as mentioned, we've borrowed a lot of terms wholesale, particularly from um, Darwin Core, um, largely because many of the concepts overlap with describing um, individual specimens. Um, we've also um, uh, attempted to look at all of the potential alignments related terms and aligned concepts with as many other standards as we could. Um, um, partly in order to promote or just to follow good practice, but also to improve interstandard interoperability. 
And one very useful exercise for that, which was recommended by one of our reviewers, was to carry out a skulls ma mapping exercise where we can use the skulls ontology and specifically its mapping relation structure to run through all of our Latin core terms and then try and work out what those relationships are with terms in other related standards. Um, and that's part of the documentation that we'll keep working on and building up over the course of time. And finally, I just wanted to um, point you at some other potential, um, some other useful bits of resources here um, about Latimer Core. Um, I've put a work in progress sticker at the top of this because um, during the expert review, we're doing this in a quite dynamic process. So we are fixing things as they're raised. Things are changing a bit. Not everything is going to be up to date or complete in these, but we'll obviously get it into the shape before the public review. And I think it's still broadly useful as long as you don't get too hung up on the details. Um, so like most um, Tabwick task groups, we have our GitHub repo that's got lots of content in it, um, going back to all the history, probably of the interest group and the task group. Um, but more specifically, I've mentioned the um, GitHub wiki um, that provides not just an overview of the standard, but also delves down into a lot of the concepts involved, gives some guidance on how he can use it and gives a lot of kind of reference examples as well. Um, so as mentioned, that's probably the best starting point. Um, there is the normative term list, um, which is what's being auto-generated by uh, Steve Scripps, and we'll go into uh, eventually the uh, Tadwig web pages on the uh, the formal standard. Um, we've got a set of class-level JSON schemas um, for people who want to go in and look at the term definitions in a different way. Um, and added to that, we're building up a, a, a set of JSON examples, and also there's more flat CSV examples in there in the repo if you want to go and look at how we've uh, tried to structure the data in a more um, pragmatic way. Um, we've got a great wiki-based sandbox, um, which is a place where we can go to try out different modeling approaches, look at things in a more RDF graphy capacity and use Sparkle queries to um, try out querying the data. And then finally, there's a Power BI browser, which is really just a, a different um, way of being able to browse through the terms in the standard and look at some of the visualizations of the uh, relationships within it. Um, yeah, and all that leads me to say is um, I have to say a huge thanks to all the people in the core team who, without whom this would not have got to where it is. There's been an enormous amount of work that's gone into it um, over the, uh, the last years. And um, there's a lot of people who've also been involved who won't fit on this slide. Um, also need to thank um, Steve and our reviewers for trying to keep us honest and uh, kick this into shape for an actual Tadwig standard. And uh, a lot of organizations have either donated people's time or in some cases, um, uh, programs that have created, given us funding for doing the work and for um, travel and things like that to actually get the standard over the line. Um, and finally, um, yeah, thank you to all of you for listening this morning and um, happy to take any questions. <laughs> Okay, so I think we have time for uh, at least one question. And uh, does anyone in the room have a question they want to ask? If so, please come up and use the microphone. Do um, you have anything in the chat? <laughs> yes. Uh, Anton Günsch, Botanic Garden, Berlin. Um, I, I think, uh, first of all, thanks for the very nice uh, um, presentation. I think one aspect is making description of collections at collection level very different from describing collections at specimen level, which is that you need to quantify the applicability of terms, so to speak. Mm. For example, if you have a collection with 95% of specimens coming from one particular country and 5% of from the rest of the world, you need to say, to be able to say this somehow, to, to give some kind mm -hmm. of quantification for this. Do you have a, a strategy for this or? Uh, we have, <clears throat> I guess you could say multiple strategies for this. And that's been a large part of the, the modeling exercises that we've done. So, um, and there's some kind of some examples in the other documentation, but, um, one way to do it is to say these are actually because we want to um, treat these slightly differently, we can create two object groups, one for the rest of the world, one for the 5% um, that's uh, from a specific place. So that's one option that you can do um, to divide down um, your data into multiple object groups for a one collection. The other option is to treat it as one single object group and then add quantifications to the relationships between that and the geographic origin. 
and that's something else that we've, we've explored and we've gone through a lot of scenarios where um you can do different things with the metrics depending on which approach you can take um, there are different pros and cons to the two of them if you split things down a lot then you can do very um agile and precise metrics um, because you are just attaching um uh, those numbers to um individual groups there's less you can do if you're just doing quantified relationships from a single one so they're both options they have different levels of effort they have different um things that you can get out of it but hopefully there's there's a way of doing it that suits each of the uh, um, the requirements there, um, because you can do it obviously against multiple different dimensions at the same time. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, so there is another question here, but we're I think we need to move on to the next um, talk. So um, maybe you could go into the Slack and uh, and answer that question offline. Is that sure. Okay, Matt. Okay, great. So uh, next up is Paco Pando is going to talk about um, about Pliny and Core. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Paco Pando, and representing here the group of people that have been developing what is called the Pliny and Core standard for a number of years. So what is Pliny and Core? Pliny and Core is a data specific specification uh, designed to represent that uh, to exchange uh, species level information. With uh, species level information, we are referring not only to the bi biological traits, but also to other aspects of the species be beyond biology, such as legislation or conservation management, and et cetera. Well, Plian Core is the, the name comes from Plian the Elder, what is considered the first naturalist. So what is uh, along a winding road? The, the concept of Plian Core started in 2004 in a discussion with uh, between the people in GIF Spain and in Bia from Costa Rica about the, the needs to have a, a good schema to exchange and represent uh, species level information. Milestones in, in this pathway, I will summarize, is the, the formalization of the specification as a XML schema. Then the, the incorporation of the developments into the TADWIC uh, framework. The um, implementation of the schema in several real life um, scenarios. Then the, the, the latest is, is, is stages um, become to, to transform what is a uh, XML schema into an SDS uh, format to comply with the uh, TADWIC uh, specifications. On the, on the right, there is the, the names of the, the people that have put more of their work into this. In these uh, more than uh, 15 years of, of work, we have received uh, financial support from GB, from, from the, um, the Mexican government, the, the Spanish government, and, and some other sources. So how that Plian uh, Core fits into the, the Tadwood world? Well, there is some, some overlap, but mostly there are a, a lot of uh, borrowed terms and reduced terms from, from other Tadwood uh, schemas, such as the, the structured descript descriptive data, the taxon composition schema, Darwin Core, Gisin, and, and some others. And as, as, as you see, what is specific of Plinian core is the elements that are not uh, just pure uh, biological features. As I was as I mentioned, uh, Plinian core has been used, it's been used in a number of real life scenarios, just, such as the uh, Ministry of Environment in Spain, in Chile. It is used for, by the Conavia for their is species pages. It is used uh, by the, the regional government and the Basque country in, in Spain and, and some others. The, the, the Plian Core uh, specification is rather complex. It has a number of classes within classes, and in total it has uh, about 250 uh, properties. One of the most advanced developments that uh, we have done with uh, Plian Core is uh, to represent it as a RDF uh, repository with uh, an um, underlying um, ontology 
that with which we have been able to to build um, sparkle endpoints to integrate that information in wider um, scenarios. Well, this is a view of the the ontology behind a linear core, and then you can see the well the link. And uh, another development that might be most um, of most interest for mostly European um, partners or users is the, the gateway to come to transform a plan core data into the, the Inspire specification, which is the, the uh, European Union standard for anything related to, to the geographic space. And with this, we are reaching to the to the latest stage in in which the the challenge is to to transform a very rich and complex uh, specification in something more simple. That is the the SDS um, specification. I'm going to review just the the three main issues that we are finding in this in this process. So, well, this is. From the the way we we depart the um, the uh, SML schema to the SDS specification. The how, well, from the the schema, we built a spreadsheet with all the terms and and the groups in which they are connected, the descriptions, the labels, and so on, and and to use this spreadsheet as the as the source to run. Uh, scripts developed by by Steve and also with the participation from the people of uh, CR Bayer from Costa Rica, uh, Manuel Vargas, um, Maria Mora, uh, William Lat as well. And uh, this was uh, a result. But here I'm bringing this this slide just to to illustrate that, for instance, in, in this case. For migratory data, we have one class and then another class and then another class and then another class. So the challenge was to to flatten that hierarchical structure, and in that process, uh, we felt we 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 lost uh, some semantic meaning. Then an, another issue is um, how to cope with uh, multiple uses of the same thing in different contexts. For instance, we use a measure and facts uh, that we call term, and we solve that, that including an equivalent X path from the SDS to the XSD file, we may, we're making use of the, the X path um, um, strings. Then uh, another um, issue was how, how to cope with the, the many terms that uh, Plin and Core borrow for, or from other standards. And the, the solution or the decision was to, to exclude them from the, the SDS file. But along with that came out a lot of information. Uh, a key point in the development of uh, Plin and Core was to, to be able to use the, the Plin Core specification within the the publication schema of, of GBIF. That means uh, including uh, PN core extensions for the, the GBIF IPT. And this is work in, in progress. And the, the final slide is that we are almost there. We are refining the SDS um, file. Still, we have some glitches to fix. The <laughs> We, I have just shown three basic uh, issues that seems very basic, but the, the complexity behind them is, is very large. I mean, we have terms in which the definition is a class in another standard that is specified as a, an XML uh, specification, which is not longer supported. Well, it was rather complex. And the, the bottom line is that the, the simplification of plain code to make it comply with SDS has been brutal. We feel we we think that maybe now we will have a more accessible, easy to use specification. But at the same time, from the people that are already using plain core, 
we get the message that um, they need more, more detail and some expansion of, of the standard. So there are some tensions there, feeling that some, well, with the, the illustration from the Procustes, the, the Greek uh, figure from the, I mean, the, the, the figure from the Greek mythology that cut the, the legs of the people that were too, too, too long to fit in, in the bed or stretch them to make them fit. And with this, uh, I finish and thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Paco. So we have time for some questions and <clears throat> it looks like there's one question in the chat. Um, what about testing and implementation in scratch pads? We have had for a long time an implementation of the species profile model, which is now the description type GBIV vocabulary. We already use it to share species level information to GBIV, and there's an example given. Well, in, in, the, in the development of uh, Core, we have developed a number of uh, gateways with uh, Delta, with SDD, with the scratch parts, we haven't, but I guess it will be not very difficult, given the, the fact that both approaches targets the same issues. Uh, are there any audience members who have a question they would like to ask? I will just make a comment. Um, about what Paco said, he mentioned several times that the SDS, um, that's the standards documentation specification, which is a, a Tadwig uh, standard for how standards should be presented. And so uh, one of the challenges that, that they faced was that the SDS really was written with vocabularies like Darwin Core in mind. And so to adapt an XML-based one uh, was challenging, and David will probably also talk about this in his talk. So we have kind of a square peg trying to fit it into a round hole. Uh, we do have time for another question if anyone has any. Okay, well, thank you, Paco. Thank you. All right, and uh, next up is Elspeth Haspen, who's gonna talk about MIDS, and I will let her tell you what MIDS is. Hi, um, yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you for the organizers for giving us a chance to, to tell you where we are with, with MIDS. So MIDS is the minimum information about a digital specimen, um, the standard. And it's something we've been developing for the last few years. Um, so without further ado, um, so MIDS itself, um, sits really at the heart of, of digitizing collections. Um, it helps with, um, with policy, it helps with, the, with putting forward a digitization strategy. Um, key things I think for, would be the, the prioritization, that it will help um, institutions um, prioritize their digitization. This is one of the aims of the, of the standard. Um, and um, it will help with the um, with the costing and then um, achieving the funding. Um, one thing that became very clear with the development of MIDS is and with digitization is that um, digitization is a kind of um, direction of travel. It's not you don't suddenly go from one place to another and you're finished. It's very much a, a long road towards a fully digitized collection. And it's getting that across to the funders as well, so that they, when the funders are are um, providing funding for digitizing a collection, 
it's not just um, necessarily a one-off payment to digitize. Um, there's going to be different levels of digit digitization that require additional funding. So um, the different levels um, that were, were developed within the standard, um, really quite a lot of thought went into, into the different levels. There's, um, a, there's like a very bare basic level, which is almost like a pre-digitization level, which I'm not really going to talk about much. Um, it was is it was really to satisfy an, uh, a demand that that certain institutions had for um, for their for their collections. The main ones I really want to talk about are mids levels one, two, and three. Um, so they were really um, developed to to answer a need. This uh, we always have to think about the the purpose of of the the work that we're doing. Um, so the the Mids level one, as I talked about, this trajectory, this direction of travel. So mids level one is essentially um, a kind of virtual cabinet, um, and it aligns with a lot of the work that people are doing with the mass digitization programs, where um, we're capturing very little um, information, but it's it's kind of a, a basic catalogue of our collections. Um, uh, with mids level two, um, then providing um, the additional data and the enhanced records leading to mids level three, which is the um, aligns very closely with the with the open digital specimen. So the work that um, the task group have been doing um, are to um, find the the um, the different information elements within each of the, the digitization levels. And for each of those information elements, um, really to focus on the, the purpose of the of the element, um, the definition I've just shown one of the examples here, which is the name, um, and then looking at the mapping because the mapping is going to be key to to the implementation, and for people to be able to actually um, monitor and and measure the 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 levels. Um, um, the one thing that we've we are also looking at is um, because a lot of the terms that we're, we're using, particularly at the lower levels of the, the mids, like mids level one, we're coming up with quite generalized terms to make sure that the barrier to entry is, is not too high. Um, and for that reason, the recommendations become more important because the recommendations are where we're, we're trying to bring in the, the data quality. Um, MIDS itself is more about presence or absence of data rather than the, the quality of data themselves. So the recommendations is where we can really look to be giving guidance on um, the data quality. Um, the other thing that, that came out of recent discussion was the, the recognition that um, there, there's probably not going to be a MIDS um, standard that will cover all disciplines um, within our community. So we've, we've then decided to kind of categorize the, the different um, into three disciplines. So we've got the biological, the geological, and the one I, 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 I apologize to all the paleo people out there, but it's a difficult word to say, um, and the paleontological. So the we've um, categorized the mid elements into into these three um, disciplines, which allows a more focused um, specification for the different collections. So, what where are we? Um, we're we're getting there over the this year. The over, particularly over the summer, we've been making quite a bit of progress um, with putting forward the the proposed elements within each of the levels. Um, and it's difficult because we're also aware that there's a there's a huge need for this um, specification. People are starting to use it already, but even before it's fully developed. And it's kind of, so we're we're trying to kind of increase the speed of travel. Um, so what we've got so far is the elements, the information elements we have are physical specimen ID and organization, the low, lowest level, then coming into um, name, and then essentially the the mids level one is about more curatorial information, the kind of what it is and where the where the specimen is held. That's kind of mids level one. 
um and and what you um so it allows someone to kind of research to kind of browse collections essentially mids level two is what we think of as much more research ready so this is more about um the collection event information so the who collected it where it was where it was collected uh, when it was collected um and this is also at this point this is where the image comes in uh we had looked at having a separate kind of um image category for each of the different levels but then it felt that that was maybe overly complicated so it was simplified and then the image was brought in at mids level two um you can see in mids level two where we've also got some information elements there are not necessarily required by all three disciplines <clears throat> so um then finally we've got uh, mids level three we've not done as much work on mids level three at the moment you can see um and we need to decide how we approach mids level three as well sorry i just realized i could have been going through the slides on this so mids level one um as i said mids level two mids level three um we have it's a dis big decision we have to make with mids level three and that is what in terms of the elements and how we approach the elements because essentially mids level three is is pretty much everything is what we're, we'd be expecting. Thank you. Um, but the key thing with mids level three is really the identifiers. This is where I think a lot of the mids level three is going to focus on, um, because this is where we need to be able to link um, to other data, and this is where the, um, the identifiers will be coming in. So that will be the focus, and that's where we're going to be working closely with the open digital specimen as well. So work plan. Um, we've got uh, the finalization of the mids elements for mids level two, so and um, and that would include the mids level zero and mid level one. Um, collaboration with the Disco Open Digital Specimen Specification Group to agree the elements that will be included in mids level three, and then the ratification process is going to be the next the next stage. How to get involved? Um, we would really like to get more people involved and um, particularly from the earth sciences um, we're realizing that for some of the information elements we need input from the earth sciences um, so um, please do get in touch we've got the the task group um, a mailing list as well so um, it's the best way if you can sign up for the mailing list then you'll be able to get the information about the meetings we have been meeting the first thursday of the month we're looking at more frequent uh, meetings potentially um, to get the work done and also um, we've got people like Matthias um, who've been developing kind of implementations and um, tools to to monitor um, the MIDS levels the more people we can get using MIDS and feeding back then that would be super helpful too and thank you very much Thanks, Elspeth. Um, do we have any questions from the audience in person? Yeah. Okay, so just come and get the microphone. Hi, Vince Smith, NHM London. Um, a hugely important standard, I think, because for a long time, the community has really struggled to express progress, especially towards things like digitization. I wanted to ask about um, mid zero. And the challenges of kind of representing the sort of total bounds of collections, because when we've used MIDS, we've struggled a little bit in that space. So I wondered if you could, uh, do you have any reflections on kind of how we can better represent, if you like, the total of the job to do in terms of digitizing at mid zero level? Uh, is that an ambition? Because I think we've had to sort of fudge mid zero in the past when we've used it um it's going to be interesting I, I part of me wonders whether mids two and the latimer core the relationship between those two things and i think that's some, that's probably the relationship we maybe need to look at um to see how those two can, things can connect connect um so maybe that's a direction that we can look at to to develop that relationship i don't know if that, I'm, i can't really at this point say much more than that but that's probably where i would look for that
So I don't know if there's any questions online or if we're good. Any other questions from the audience here? All right, well, thank you so much, Elspeth. So that's the end of the new standards that will soon, that are already or soon will be uh, undergoing review under the um, supervision of a review manager. So next up is uh, David Pitchmuller, who's going to talk to us about um, ABCD, which is a somewhat unusual case, and I guess he'll explain to us his situation. Good morning, everybody. So yeah, I'm here to talk about the current state of the re-ratification of ABCD2 and the ratification of EFG under the SDS guidelines. So um, first of all, uh, I guess many of you have heard of ABCD just to uh, fill everybody up on the same level. What is ABCD? First of all, it stands for Access to Biological Collection Data, and it is an XML standard to exchange biological collection and observation data. It's been around for a little over 20 years, and it is quite extensive. Uh, so we have more than 1,400 concepts in terms of different um, X paths you can have within the XML tree. So X path being this long string at the bottom uh, where all of the parent elements are mentioned. And um, there are a couple of extensions, but uh, the one that's really important for today is the extension for geoscience, EFG. Um, so why do we need this ratification? Um, so ABCD2, well, ABCD2.06, but in the context of today's talk, when I say ABCD2, I mean this one, was ratified in 2005. Uh, this was prior to the ratification of the standards, documentation standards, SDS. Um, so it is now listed as a yeah, 2005 standard on the TEDWIC website. In 2017, ABCD EFG was submitted for ratification, and uh, this took a while. And in the process, uh, eventually, uh, yeah, it came up that for compatibility reasons, it would be really good if ABCD2 would also be ratified under those SDS rules to make them comparable. So um, the first challenge: okay, how do we document an XML standard under those rules, um, as Paco already mentioned. So uh, Plin and Core was having the same issue. So uh, I sat together with the Plin and Core people in May and June, and we came up with some ideas that we presented to the technical architecture group. First of all, the SDS is quite good in describing the terms and all of the yeah, necessary attributes to understand the term and what it's used for. Um, but the important thing that is lacking from our side of view is the structure. So uh, for an XML standard, um, this can be looked at via two certain ways. One way is the schema file for Plinian Core and ABCD and EFG as well. Those are XML schema files, but it could also be a DTT file or a relaxng file. And then on a particular uh, term, uh, we would then have the individual X path of that term, plus some additional information about the cardinality. Is it mandatory? Is it repeatable? And the ordering, where within the XML, uh, with the parent XML element, is a particular term located? Um, so uh, first of all, uh, the next question was, which version should we ratify? I mean, it's clear it's ABCD 206. But there's not just one version, there are a couple of them. And again, they are not as straightforward as the names implies. Some are backward compatible, some are not. The ordering is, uh, again, historic reasons. Um, so we're going to focus on ABCD 2.06F. You probably haven't heard those uh, additional letters. They're like internal things. But this is uh, the most extensive, while mostly backward compatible version um, that we currently have. And also um, this is going to be the baseline for the ratification. So we are not going to look back at previous versions of those individual terms 
um, whatever the, wherever they have been documented in previous points in time, like the, the current Tedwick terms wiki. Um, so this is where we are going to start with and work with. Um, how will this look like? Well, um, the current standard mainly has a primer as an introduction and the XML schema file, which is the ratified part. So um, with a new specification, it would like this. So we have a bit of introduction. We have the list of terms. Those terms are normative for the definition of those terms. And the XML schema would still be part of the standard. And this one would be normative for the structure. We then have a primer, the different versions of those terms, and then maybe also a dedicated section for mappings to other standards. Um, so for the individual term, um, the first part, pretty classic uh, compared to other standards, um, IRI label examples, definitions, and so on. And then the X path, the cardinality and the ordering. But for the term level, again, this is more on informational level because the structure really is hard coded in this or described in the schema. So if there's any um, misalignment, the schema would overwrite those uh, elements specified here. So this is how it would look on a particular example. So all of the terms have IRIs, so shorter names, so that it's easier to refer to them. They have a one-to-one -one relationship to the X path, just makes it a bit easier to handle. And um, also then as a HTTP URI resolvable. And um, yeah, the rest you can see the examples. Cardinality in this case would be that it is mandatory, but not repeatable. And the ordering means like data set is the first element within data sets, units, is the seventh element within data set and the unit. Oh, sorry, that's a mistake. There should be an additional one. So, and the unit ID is the fourth element within unit. Um, there are still a couple of open questions. So how do we handle controlled vocabularies? In the XML schema, there are, in ABCD, there are 13 controlled vocabularies. In EFG, there are 11. Not all of them are worth um, defining as controlled vocabularies according to the SDS rules. There might be three or something like that, uh, like record bases where this is useful and necessary, but some others uh, we can just yeah document them as recommendations for the individual term. Um, how do we handle the mapping to other standards? Um, this is an open issue, I guess, for many of the other Tedrick standards um, to have a good common way of, of documenting those uh, mappings, especially if they are not like a direct one-to-one -one, uh, mapping. So my default example is the uh, Darwin core higher taxonomies like um, order is the same as higher taxon uh, name if higher taxon rank equals order in ABCD. And then um, how do we group those uh, concepts uh, for the standard in a sensible way? If we just group them by the parent element, you would still have like 500 or something uh, groups. So um, this wouldn't really make it practical. So we need some sensible grouping and like measurements and facts and taxon identification, uh, unit metadata um, that makes it actually yeah, you, easy for a user to navigate the standard. So um, there's still a couple of things to do. Um, there's still a couple of unclear definitions, also examples. Um, some are just, yeah, writing things down, uh, pretty obvious stuff. Others require expert uh, input, at least certainly things I cannot uh, come up with myself. Uh, we then need to run the export pipeline provided by Steve uh, to document or to generate all of the required documents and then uh, the yeah actual writing of the introduction the primer not really um, difficult stuff just a bit of work and lastly the integration in the actual Tedwig website um, uh, in, yeah in a sensible way 
why hasn't this happened so far? Well, first of all, it's the limited time for everybody involved. Um, uh, yeah, uh, this is also the reason why we made so little progress in the last year. Um, and I think I mentioned it, it's quite a huge standard. So again, ABCD, more than 1,400 elements, EFG, even larger. And it's kind of hard to get a feeling what this number actually means. So this is me last week on another talk uh, showing us uh, yeah, a printout of one single unit where all of the elements are actually filled. Um, there's some nonsensical stuff in there, uh, but just, yeah, you try to read the fine print uh, uh, in terms of what 1,400 elements actually looks like. If we go through each single one and only take like five minutes to work on one, for both ABCD and EFG together it would be almost like two months of work. So things don't really scale well in those ranges of numbers. And so next up is well, we need to finish the re-ratification and then also finish the ratification of EFG. And then also eventually we need to um, tackle the ratification of ABCD3. I haven't talked about this today at all for good reason. Um, we do have the interest group. Um, so if you're interested and want to help join in, make us some progress, the next meeting is on the 7th of November during the Sedwick Workshop Week in the afternoon for European time, in the morning for uh, the American time zones. Um, besides the other things I already mentioned, we do want to um, need to upgrade the charter, which is also a bit outdated. And generally, it would be nice to have more frequent meetings um to actually yeah make some progress so if you want to please join the meeting uh, and if you have any issues or questions you can submit them to the github page so again the, the links and yeah i'd be happy to take any questions okay great i think we have time for at least one question so anyone in the audience here have a question they'd like to ask, just come on up to the microphone. Okay, last call for questions. All right, I don't see any questions. Well, thanks, David. Yeah. I've been monitoring the Slack channel. So if you come up with any other questions, just put them there. So the next, uh, the next part of this is uh, additions to, uh, I guess I should say complicated or uh, large additions to existing standards. So uh, Jani, who's gonna uh, talk about Humboldt Core, which is gonna be an extension to Darwin Core. Hello, everybody. I'm Shanina Sika. I'm the convener of the Humble Task Group in Tadwig. Um, but here I'm I'm talking on behalf of this amazing group members that we have in the in the task group, and you will see um, all their names in the in the multiple slides. Um, so our goal with the Humble Task Group is to develop metadata standards for biodiversity or, or biological inventories. So this first few slides is just to understand what is inventory data and how it um, differs from incidental records that we generally see in GBIF. So basically what I'm showing here is the, the how by inventory data um, sort of like separates it itself from, from incident records. And so in the table, you'll see um, five ways of describing um, biodiversity data, which is based like on the people that is doing the sampling, the methods that are carried out, the spatial temporal scope, the taxonomic scope, and the output, which is the uh, species list. And so for incidental records, which is the first line in that table, you can see that the spatial temporal scope is very limited to the species occurrence, so where you saw that species. 
And we don't have information about the taxonomic scope. So there's no information of what other species or the expected species that are in a region. And so the output list is, um, we do not have information of the non-detections of the species. And we can only say uh, what species are present. Hence that type of data, it's only a presence data. However, with inventories, and you will see three, th three examples there, the spatiotemporal uh, scope changes, um, but it's basically larger because it's the area under sampling. And we always have information about the taxonomic scope, so the, the targeted species. And so with that information, we know which species have not been detected. Of course, this depends on the methods and the effort um, included in the, in the sampling design. Uh, but there, we have information to, um, to make inferences about absences. So this is what we called presence absence data. And so in summary, um, inventory data has, um, it's a, you, you can retrieve high quality ecological data with, with that type of sampling, and which is particularly relevant to assessing and modeling biodiversity and its change. Um, because it enables um, inference about absence of species in that area and at that particular time. However, their reliability for use in downstream models depends on knowing about the inventory process. So some of the things that I was saying before, the, the taxonomic scope, the spatial scope, the methodology, the associated sampling effort and completeness. And that particular information is often unreported or described in a very unstructured manner. Um, so you will see, for example, that currently in the Darwin Core Standard, um, you have some fields to complete some of some of that information that is required in the sampling in the sorry in the inventory process. For instance, the sampling protocol, the sampling effort. But that's being done currently in a very flat structure. So there's no um, easy way to describe the detailed information and the different structures and complexity of, of nesting that some of the sampling, um, sampling designs might require. And so we built on the um, event concept in Darwin Core. Uh, I will not say too much about the events. We had yesterday uh, a whole session about event-based um, samplings, uh, but in but using this event concept, we can think of inventories as uh, different events or as, as events with different nesting levels. And just to let you know that the event is, uh, the description is an action that occurs at some location during some time. So that's why that concept allows us to, to work on these nesting levels. In this, this is a very descriptive figure. I'm just going to say that if you move from the from the um, from below to up, you will see that hierarchical nesting's complexity. So from the very below, it's only one event, one occurrence. And so it's a one-to-one -one relationship. Whereas in general, uh, inventory protocols have a more nested. Um, and, and complex hierarchical structure where at the very top, you will see that it's a, a design carried out in a sampled area where there's plots nested within sites. And so this sort of like parent-child hierarchical data starts appearing. And so what we have been doing over the last almost two years um, is that we um, sort of started from uh, Rob Guralny's paper in 2018 that um, described the framework of Humble Core. Um, and we've been developing that, that um, framework since, since that, with that paper. And that was described in that paper, sorry. Um, the, the biggest change that we did is that since we were taking advantage of this event concept, we decided to build an extension to the Darwin Core instead of developing its own Humboldt core. So that's why you will see the difference in the naming convention. And so over the last two years, we've revised all original terms, reformulated definitions, discarded terms, added new ones. 
And I'm sure that we will need to add many more after testing phase and, and, and all the different um, task, task steps. And so basically what we are trying to do with the Humboldt extension to Darwin Core is to provide a minimum information vocabulary. So this number of terms um, that describes the inventory process. And so currently we have defined 46 terms. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and we've divided them in these six categories, um, some terms describing the, the general data set and the people that perform the, the um, samplings. Um, many terms are related to um, describing the geospatial scope, the temporal scope, and the taxonomic scope of, the, of those inventories. Uh, multiple terms relate to the methodol the sorry the methodologies and carried out and the different protocols and a lot of information about how the nestingness of sites plots traps etc that it's very common in in biodiversity sampling and then some other terms related to completeness so how um, the 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 survey is complete, and what was the effort um, that was carried out? And so we have developed documentation on the Humboldt extension, which describes some of those basic uh, concepts, and um, some sort of like a user guide to test this extension using um, GB5PT. We've developed this. Um, test mode for the GB5PT so people could publish in a testing way their data sets using the Humboldt extension. And, and we also have developed a feedback form so that we can get an understanding of what terms are we missing or what definitions are not clear um, and any other things that, that you may bring. And so here I'm just showing one of the most complex um, data sets that we've tested so far. Um, this comes from the Antarctic GBIF and Ovis nodes. Um, and so this is, uh, this is quite an interesting sampling design. They have this uh, station grids and they go to different samplings with multiple uh, sampling stations and they have two different protocols. One is like the routine troll, um, but but another one is a targeted troll so that when they know that there's some fish um, underneath the boat, they, they do it. And um, Ming Gang, who is part of the of the task, ta task group, um, has modeled this data set using the event core, the Humboldt extension, the occurrence extension, and the measurement of facts ex extension. So it's a very interesting data set, and you can see it in this testing mode of the IPT in, in GBIF. And she is connected. So if you have any questions about this particular data set, she can, she can answer. Um, we've also been working with the Field Museum. Thank you. Uh, with the Field Museum, with their rapid inventories data, we have worked uh, and mapped multiple data sets in the Map of Life platform uh, using the Humboldt extension. Um, and some other data sets that I don't recall right now. Um, and we have initial feedback and we have identified some key challenges um, in, the, in the Humboldt extension as it is right now. Um, for instance, uh, one of the first things that we come up that, uh, yeah, that, that it's like one of the, the hardest thing um, when including the Humboldt extension is the different ways in which people structure data, their data and, the, and their data model behind that um, information or that biodiversity data. And that's especially e not easy when we're talking about this hierarchical organization in, in sampling protocols. Um, in, in this uh, example that I was showing before, one of the key challenges that we've also found is the information inheritance. So what information is inherited from the parent event to the children event and what, informa what information needs to be populated based on the children um, events. Um, 
And so most of the humbled terms, all the child inherit parents' information, but in some cases they don't. And this is this is one of the examples with um, abundance reported and absence reported where that information is not inherited. Another key challenge is, is how to standardize protocols. Uh, Peter Brenton and Rob Stevenson are working on categorizing methodologies, but it's a hard task. Um, other challenges is about the completeness measurements. So what, um, what are we talking about completeness? Are we talking about completeness in the data or are we talking about how that completeness is inferred from the, the data? Um, how to define the taxonomic scopes and how to define the effort measurements. Um, of course, we have tried with a couple of data sets, but every time we map a new data set, more issues or complexities come. So we welcome everybody that has, this, um, especially these complex um, sampling types and, and yeah, reach out to us, be part of our meetings. We meet regularly week on Wednesdays morning. So yeah, um, every every new data set has, it's very important to help us develop the, the standards better. Um, I don't know if I if I have one more minute, um, the next steps would be to develop better, better documentation, go through the public review and finally ratify um, as, as a Tadwit standards. So thank you and thank all the amazing members in the task group. Um, some of them are mentioned here and some of them were mentioned in the, in the first part. Um, special thanks to Ming Gang and Paula Sermuglio that helped me put up with, with the slides. So. Thank you, and you're more than welcome to join our task group. Well, I don't know if I did. Hey, I think we have time for one question, if, if someone has one. Um, okay. If you could just come up and use this microphone, it'd be great. Thanks for this nice talk. I'm Jitendra Gaikwar from Frederick Schiller University. I have uh, rather two questions, let's say. Uh, so who are going to be the typical user of this, let's say, standard? And what kind of expertise they would need to use it? Typical users for the standards would be everybody who has biodiversity data and wants to publish it and make it public for everybody and, in, and in exchange their data. Uh, we are thinking that this, we are making this extension as flexible as possible so that it could include from, from research-based data with like complex sampling designs until um, community science data. We've been working with eBird to understand how they can map their, their current data with this standard. Um, other other people, uh, yeah, citizen science that want to report their occurrences. Um, so the idea is to make it as flexible so that everybody can use it. And the level of expertise, I think it depends on, yeah, on the on what people want to share and what level of detail they want to share it from their sampling. Thank you. Okay, so um, we'll go ahead and move on and there'll be some time for more uh, discussion and questions at the end. And uh, next up is me. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm gonna talk on uh, behalf of my uh, co-authors, Jennifer Giron and Matthew Nielsen uh, about the uh, new addition to the Audubon Core Multimedia Standard controlled vocabularies for subject part and subject orientation. So many of you are familiar with Darwin Core. Audubon Core is sort of like a partner standard that is for describing media items. So um, there are actually several different terms that are involved here. Sub the term subject part and subject part literal both um, describe the part of the organism that is depicted in the image. The difference is that subject part 
is intended to have a value that's an IRI, and subject part literal is intended to have a value that's a controlled value string. And so what we have done in developing those vocabularies is to say that those control value strings should come from the controlled vocabularies that our group has created. The other term that's involved is subject orientation. So the subject orientation is the uh, direction, the, the orientation or the viewing direction that that particular part is being seen from. And again, the term subject orientation is expected to have an IRI value and subject orientation literal is expected to have a controlled value string from our controlled vocabularies. So our task group has been working since 2019. It seems like it's been forever, but we are very close to the finish line. We have five core members and uh, a lot of people who participated regularly in the development. We've had a whole bunch of meetings over the past three years. And one of the things that um, Johnny talked about and, and I'm also gonna talk about is that we've been following a process described in the vocabulary maintenance specification that involves collecting use cases, uh, developing like the requirements for what you're trying to do, and then um, having implementation testing to see if those requirements can actually been, be met by real people using real data. So we, uh, after developing the vocabularies during this past spring, we had some test implementers who used our vocabularies to verify that they could actually be used to meet the requirements that we established. And so, we did it, and we have written up the results of that in an implementation experience report, which has been submitted as a paper to the Tadwig Journal, BIS. And we have just recently submitted to our parent interest group, the Audubon Core Maintenance Group, a proposal for these uh, vocabularies to be ratified. So we, as soon as they have their next meeting and give us their stamp of approval, we will be moving to the public comment stage, which I mentioned in the beginning. So if you look at the definitions of the terms and the, the metadata that's um, involved, those are described in using simple knowledge organization system or SCOS terms. So um, one of the features of using SCOS is that you can have multi, it supports multilingual labels, which is very important for an international organization like Tadwig. It also supports some limited uh, hierarchy, in particular, if certain concepts are broader than other concepts, you can indicate that. And we are also, in addition to expressing this in human readable form, uh, we use the IRI versions of the uh, concepts to describe these things in machine-readable JSON-LD serialization. Another part of the machine-readable uh, metadata is that we have created links from our concepts to standardized ontologies, and that is also machine-readable. So here's an example of an image, uh, two images that are described using the subject part controlled vocabularies. Uh, oops. So you can see uh, here is the controlled value string for four wing. And then if you were using the subject part term, this would be the IRI that you, that you would use. And this is an example of a case where we have this narrower term four wing actually has a broader concept that also applies, which is wing. In a botanical example, here we have controlled value flower, and the corresponding IRI, and it has the broader category in fluorescence. So once you've specified a subject part, then you can describe the orientation of that part in the image. So in this example, for subject orientation literal, this is a dorsal view, and this is the IRI. Uh, for this specimen here, the orientation is the left side, so we use the string left, and it has a broader concept. It's also a lateral view as well. So um, we have 
quite a number of terms in these vocabularies. And in order to guide people in how to use them, we've created a, what are called SCOS collections, which basically is telling people that um, if you have a particular organism group, for example, herbaceous angiosperms, then these are the subject part terms that would be appropriate to use for that organism group. So those are available in machine readable text. And then this is, uh, uh, sorry, in human readable text. And then this is what the machine readable JSON LD looks like. So a developer could uh, read in this information in an application and use it to guide a user. So once you have determined that you have an insect and the part you're looking at is a thorax, then we have another set of collection, which is the orientations that are appropriate for a particular part. So if your image is of a thorax, then these are the subject orientations that would be appropriate. If your image is of a flower, these are the orientations that are appropriate for flowers. So through using these two kinds of collections, um, an application that uses the machine readable data can guide users to appropriate values. You could also use this during data cleaning to determine whether a particular image has a, a, a value that's not appropriate for the particular organism group or the particular view. Um, I mentioned the importance of these things being multilingual. So one of the things that, um, that controlled vocabularies in Tadwig do is to differentiate between the controlled value string, which is language independent. Typically, it's a, it's a camel case uh, English a phrase. So in this case, male cone in camel case is what everyone in every language would put in a spreadsheet. But then we also have labels in multiple languages. So for example, so far we have it translated into English and Spanish, and hopefully we can make it available in other languages. So um, a, an application can present the uh, information to a human user in their own language while still keeping it associated with the correct controlled value string. So this is what a record would look like for an image, a, a kind of a full record. So here we see subject part literal flower. So this is an apical view. And so in your spreadsheet or whatever, you would use these controlled value strings. But when presenting information to a user, you would prevent, present these labels in their own language. So for an English speaker, flower apical side, Spanish speaker, flor lado apical. Uh, and um, in addition to being able to apply these to entire images, you can also apply these terms to what we call a region of interest. So here's a composite image, and we can indicate that this particular region is an entire organism, and it's uh, the left side. So this is, again, what you would put in like your table. But for the human user, again, we are able to present the uh, labels in their own language. All right, so um, we had a lot of people who put in a lot of work. Um, these are some of the members of our task group who met regularly. Uh, and also we'd like to acknowledge the testers who helped us in the implementation testing. This was a very important part of the process. Um, and also I would like to thank the uh, Audubon Core Maintenance Group, which is our parent interest group uh, that will be uh, guiding us through the ratification process. So if you are interested in uh, knowing more details about this or how to use it, we prepared a guide um, for the, oops, sorry. We prepared a guide for the implementers, which is essentially a user guide that's available on the Audubon Core GitHub repository. Um, if you want to see the actual proposal, which is not quite, it hasn't been approved for public review, but I'm assuming the next time Audubon Core meets, it will, you'll get a notification through Tadwig communication channels that uh, you can have a public comment. So if you want to look at the actual proposal, you can check that out. And the implementation experience report hasn't yet been published in BIS, 
but our uh, submitted version is available on the GitHub site. So if you want to know all the details of implementation, you can check that out. So thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah, so it looked fantastic. Um, what I'm wondering about is if you have several million pictures on iNaturalist or citizen science observations, but you want to tag them with the orientation of the organism, what organism it is, what part of an organism it is, you could use machine learning to do that and put that into Audubon core to be able to filter out the, the images you want to find. Have you got any way to show within Audubon core where you got the source of the information from? Because obviously there's a degree of uncertainty when you use things like machine learning. Um, that's not something that we um, that we did. Uh, there were actually a number of things that people wanted to do. I, I mentioned that we collected use cases and had some candidate requirements. Um, so actually, like describing the provenance of the, uh, you know, how the orientations were determined, that wasn't in there. But like one of the use cases that people had was to describe orientations that were not like directly dorsal or directly uh, lateral. So like it's at a 30 degree angle from whatever. And uh, that optimally we would have that, um, but we decided it was too much for the first go around. So we hope that um, we, so one of the key things about all Tadwig vocabularies is that they're all extensible. And the same thing is true, like we have a lot of organism groups that we um, that we haven't included yet. And like we're working on fungi and uh, several other groups. So this is something that we could potentially develop in the future, but uh, but we don't have it right now. So I stopped timing myself. Are we out of time? <laughs> okay. No questions in the chat. All right. Well. Oh yeah, go ahead. There we go. Okay. Um, how have you think about bulk images? For example, if you have an insect collection with a with a case of multiple specimens in a case. Yeah. So that um, in the one of the slides that I showed, uh, I showed an example of. Oh, it's not there anymore. Um, so the. Uh, okay, so during the process of work of this group working, um, there was a, a separate effort that wasn't actually a part of our test group task group uh, on defining a proposal for um, for describing regions of interest within an image, and so that's actually already a part of Audubon Core uh, the standard. So if you have multiple, uh, you know either multiple organisms in like a photo of a case, or if you have like say an herbarium specimen and you want to indicate where the flower is on the specimen, uh, there is a protocol now that's a part of Audubon Core, uh, it's called regions of interest that you can use to do that. And uh, so you can apply these controlled vocabulary terms to either the entire image, or you can specify a particular region that they apply to. Okay, I think I probably used up all my time, so. <laughs> okay. Okay, so our last uh, talk is gonna be a recording. And uh, this, so, this is Teresa Mayfield Meyer, uh, who's going to be talking about material sample uh, and its properties. And she is on the call and will be able to answer questions live at the end. Welcome everyone to the activity update for the material sample task group. 
Our task group was chartered to investigate and make recommendations on current shortcomings in the capacity to share, reuse, compare, and relate physical objects to one another and to other concepts, and further integrate with other sources of biodiversity data. Our goals currently are to achieve a clear conceptual delineation between the terms material sample, preserved specimen, living specimen, and fossil specimen, determine the conceptual relation of these terms and the term organism, consider the possible implications of the activities towards the activities of other projects, including GR cycle, the development of Latimer core, and the diversification of the GBIF data model, and to consider existing standards that should inform our work. We feel that we've accomplished our first goal, a clear conceptual delineation between the terms material sample, preserved specimen, living specimen, and fossil specimen. We feel there is no reason to include four classes that describe physical objects, so we have developed a better definition for the term material sample, which we believe to be the broadest of the four terms, and we feel the other three terms should be deprecated in favor of a new property possibly material sample type that can better handle the more descriptive terms for material. We also feel that we've completed our second goal, determining the conceptual relation of, term, of the terms organism and material sample. When did this plant cease being an organism and begin being a material sample? Can it be both at the same time? Organisms change over time due to their own life processes, while material samples may change over time, but the changes are not necessarily due to the life processes of the sampled organism. In short, an organism may be a material sample, such as trees in a botanic garden or mice in a lab, but a material sample does not need to be an organism, although it may have once been part of one, like a study skin or a blood sample. Our third goal is ongoing, but we are acutely aware of the development of a potential new data model at the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. We have noticed that the material entity in use in GBIF's new model meshes quite well with our proposal for material sample and material sample ID. It also seems clear that a type or multiple type terms will be needed to allow for parsing of material at both coarse and fine levels. In addition, the new model provides for assertions about material samples that we believe could encompass existing occurrence properties, such as preparation and disposition, and potential new properties, such as preservation method. The DINA Consortium is an open collaboration of like-minded practitioners for developing modular open source software solutions for collection management. It focuses on bridging current gaps in how data on living collections, preserved specimens, derivatives such as tissue samples, or information artifacts such as sequence data can be managed together in a coherent way. The DINA system is built using process and state-based representations of object histories as the main principle for knowledge organization. The task group's goal of providing a more refined and better embedded concept of material sample in Darwin Core informs the structure of DINA's representations and data exports and vice versa. An extension of the material sample concept to represent properties of samples of physical objects along several dimensions aligns well with the approach currently taken by the proposal for the Latimer Core standard currently under expert review. Latimer Core has the goal to enable the representation of structured data about groups of objects that are held by collections and their subcomponents. It will be Tadwig's standard for describing collections. Most of the terms required to describe single material samples or entities are also of use at the collection level to describe what to expect when accessing whole collections or groups of objects. Terms related to the properties of objects are part of the object group class, Latimer Core's central collection level class. These terms pick up and align with existing terms defined within Darwin Core and the standard developed by the Global Genome Biodiversity Network. 
In addition, Latimer Court incorporated concepts from some earlier discussions within the material sample group by, for example, defining a property based type of collection that allows a high level distinction between material samples and information artifacts. Overall, Latimer Core plans to align its terms with the solutions found by the material sample group. The final goal I will cover today is that as we proceed, we consider existing standards that should inform our work. We don't want to reinvent the wheel, so we've been looking for other projects from which we might draw inspiration. As we began to consider material sample type, we were made aware of the work of the Internet of Samples, or iSamples. iSamples is a multidisciplinary and multi-institutional project funded by the National Science Foundation to design, develop, and promote service infrastructure to uniquely, consistently, and conveniently identify material samples record metadata about them, and persistently link them to other samples and derive digital content, including images, data, and publications. This effort has been ongoing, and the iSamples group has made significant progress in developing a framework for describing physical material. The material sample task group is evaluating the iSamples model and considering whether it can be adopted into Darwin Core as it stands as new terms with recommended controlled vocabularies or if not, if it can be used as a base for what might be needed. The Global Genome Biodiversity Network has developed several extensions to the GBIF Darwin Core archive that include terms and vocabulary that might also inform our work. Although mostly specific to material meant for molecular analysis, some of the broader terms, definitions, and vocabulary may still apply, so we want to keep this in mind. So we've come a long way, but there's still work to be done. The biodiversity data community has a lot of activity that either feeds into or depends on a strong ability to describe and share information about biological materials. The material sample task group will continue to work on ensuring that Darwin Core has the appropriate terms to work with the emerging frameworks. I would like to thank all of the members of the material sample task group for the time and effort they have given over the last year to this work. Also, the iSamples Working Group and the Latimer Core Task Group for their contribution to our discussions and work. And thank you for participating today. All right, uh, so Teresa has generously gotten up in the middle of the night, uh, and I think she's on the call. So um, if we have any questions from the room, I think she's available to answer them, or at least we can try. So if you have any questions, uh, come on up to the microphone, and we can also check the chat. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any questions here, so I guess, and none in the chat. So uh, we built some time into the end of the uh, session here to have uh, either additional questions to the presenters or also um, a bit of discussion about um, like the standards development process itself. So if you're, as I said, if you're new to Tadwig, uh, what you've seen during this session is like a real example of how the actual work gets done by task groups. Um, and we are seeing a lot of examples of that. Um, I would like to uh, just give David a, a opportunity. There were a couple questions that came up in uh, Slack about ABCD uh, and uh, who's using it and what its relationship is to Darwin Core. And they've been answered in Slack, but I was just wondering, David, do you want to take a few moments and just kind of summarize some of what you said there? So, yes, um, 
So Anne Fuchs from the Atlas of Living Australia uh, was raising a question of what are the, the advantages of using ABCD? Uh, why not just use Darwin Core? And so there's, there was, uh, yeah, there was an entire discussion about this. Uh, to, just to summarize in general, uh, ABCD is due to its complexity, it's more expressive. Um, and uh, so there are several things that you can express with ABCD that um, is beyond Darwin Core particular the, the limits of the star schema of, of uh, the Darwin core. And um, then there are like special interest nets networks um, like GeoCase that use ABCD in combination with uh, the EFG extension. And um, then uh, uh, Tim Robertson also uh, jumped in. Um, in how this relates to the new um, GBIF data model and that the data model is um, explicitly not developed for Darwin core, but just in general. And so um, even though there is no direct connection to ABCD yet, it is an open topic that uh, Tim and Jörg are going to work on to see how um, the interaction between those two standards can better work and how they can influence the, the new GBIF data model. I think I, those are like the, the main points. Go read in the Slack if you are interested in the details. Thank you, David. Are there any questions that um, in the audience, either remote or locally to any of the other uh, speakers? Also, if you have any questions about like task groups and <laughs> public comment or the entire standards process, please feel free to ask those as well. Hi, hello, my name is Marie. I work at the GBF Secretariat. Um, I'm not super familiar with um, the review process for standards, and I was wondering, like, how does it work? Do you, do you how do you find the people to review it? Is it like just internal? Do you go to outside of Tadwick, or yeah, just general question? Okay, I can answer that. So um, the process is the process for um, creating a new standard is a little different to um, adding on to uh, existing standards. For new standards, uh, it's quite well spelled out. So what happens is that um, once the task group believes that they have a, a deliverable that's, that's ready for review, then um, the executive commit, since there isn't any uh, organization in place for managing that, the executive committee uh, finds uh, a review manager, and you know this. It's 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 not a very exacting process. A lot of, a lot of times, I tell groups that are uh, forming a task group, don't take every single person who knows about this subject and put them in your task group because somebody's going to have to be the review manager. So like, uh, so usually the the people in the task group have some ideas about. Uh, who are people? It could be within Tadwig. Um, it's also actually quite desirable. Uh, well, okay. So the review manager can be anyone. It's mostly someone who's organized and can like, you know, manage things. And then the review manager is actually uh, the one who finds the expert reviewers. And the, the expert reviewers can be from within Tadwig, but it's often been helpful to have people from outside of Tadwig. Um, to look at it because they often have like a, a fresh view. And like for Latimer Core, we have we have a kind of internal Tadwig person and a person who has experience with uh, like W3C standards who's providing a lot of valuable feedback. So it's really kind of up to the review manager to, to select the expert reviewers. In the case of adding to an existing vocabulary, there's not actually a requirement for an expert review, uh, but that's kind of up to the maintenance group. If it's something that's really complicated uh, 
or, or if the task group itself thinks that it would be beneficial to have an expert reviewer, um, it's possible to, I, I don't think anybody's actually done that. But part of the idea of having the maintenance group is that that group itself would contain uh, like uh, experts in that area. And so the maintenance group itself is actually functioning as sort of like an expert review. So in, in the process of deciding like, is this ready to go to public comment? They may come back to the task group and say, well, we've looked at this and we think it's like kind of deficient and you should do these things. So I don't know if that answered the question, but great. Any other questions about uh, the, how the process works or what's going to happen with these upcoming public reviews? Okay. Yes, Damiano Aldoni here. Um, I have just a question about the last presentation and um, the fact that to build new standards. Um, why not extending Darwin code directly using the Grand Unified model instead of making a new standard? Maybe it's a naive question. And uh, how information facilities as GBIF could deal with different standards and ingesting data in different standards? Yeah, so I think I can answer, I, I participated, you're talking about the material sample uh, proposal, yeah. So, um, so I actually participate in that group the material sample uh, group isn't actually proposing a new standard. Um, it's really, the effort is to try to kind of clean up the existing um, uh, classes that are used to describe material things. So like right now, you can say that it's a, a preserved specimen or a living specimen, um, but that's, it, there are some deficiencies in that. And so there's been a lot of discussion about how, um, you know, how to make this clearer. Uh, and what do you do about things that don't um, fall into those three categories? What kind of metadata could you use to describe them more clearly? So it's not really going to be a new standard. It's really, uh, it would probably add some terms to the existing Darwin core. And I don't know if Teresa is there, if she can say more about that, but. Yeah, I can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I would have said exactly what you just said. Uh, we're not proposing any new standards, just trying to provide better terms in Darwin Core for describing material. And I, I should also just say uh, with respect to the process, so the process of adding to an existing vocabulary standard, it's really very flexible. It can range anywhere from just uh, changing something about an existing term or adding one term to really more complicated things like adding an entire controlled vocabulary or an entire extension like Humboldt Core. So the degree of organization that's involved in making the changes is going to depend on how complicated the thing is that you want to do. So if you're just simply saying, hey, I need to clarify uh, the definition of a term, then both um, the, the two standards that have maintenance groups, which is Darwin Core Maintenance Group and Audubon Core, they both have like a procedure for uh, using the GitHub issue tracker to propose changes. So if it's a simple change, you just go to the issue tracker, you make a proposal and it just gets handled that way. If it's a, a much larger and more complicated thing, then you might get into the situation where you would form a task group like the humble core or the, the uh, subject part, subject orient orientation control vocabularies. That's too big to handle in the issue tracker and you need to have a task group. And um, so the vocabulary maintenance specification, which is a, a goes along with the standards documentation specification, the standards documentation specification says like, how do you write this up for humans and machines? 
the vocabulary maintenance specification is about the process, like how do you make changes? And, and it describes some flexibility based on how complicated the changes are. So I'll just refer you to, the, to those. I can put those in the chat if you're curious about more details. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, Elspeth Houston. Um, it's a, sorry, it's, a, it's not an easy question, so I apologize for this one. Um, but looking at the, the material sample group um, and the material sample type um, and the eye samples work, I guess my question is, <laughs> is anyone, are any of these groups, including the concepts anywhere, um, and kind of, I'm trying to kind of work out where they come in. You've got, at the moment, there's kind of a couple of concepts. We've got the, the kind of basis of record concept in, in GBIF, which I think material sample group has been looking at and the kind of the preserved specimen, the fossil specimen, living specimen, et cetera. Um, so there's that kind of general kind of term. Um, but then there's the other ones, that, things like the microscope slide, herbarium sheet, um, et cetera. Now, I think those are, I think has been seen as slightly problematic, I think, by the eye samples group, but they are kind of used quite generally. And I'm just wondering, are these coming into any of these um, groups at all, the, either the material sample group or the um, eye samples? Teresa, if you're still on here, do you want to take that? Yeah, I can take that. Um, yes, we have definitely um, talked about this. And Looking at the, the terms from the eye samples group, for us, at least for me, and I think many members of the group, we're still in the preliminary stages of looking at these, but they're sort of coarse categorizations of things. Um, whereas, you know, herbarium sheet is a very specific description of the object you have. So um, we're also considering that beyond these sort of course terms, there will potentially be a term, to, a place to put that information, right? So that you can very specifically describe what you have. So um, as I said, this, we're currently in the throes of talking about material sample type and how we should handle that and how people might use these kind of terms to either search for things or categorize their things. So um, anybody who's interested in this very specifically, I would love to have you come participate with our task group because um, this is kind of where we're at right now, looking at test cases for the eye samples terms and what else might be necessary. Thank you. Okay, we are at time, uh, and I, I welcome you to uh, everybody I'm sure is desperate for coffee and the remote people want to go back to bed. <laughs> so um, we'll adjourn right now, but I hope we can continue this conversation for the rest of the conference and over the coffee break. Thank you very much. And I didn't recognize Johnny, who also helped organize a symposium. Thank you. <laughs>